in, in the uplands, the, they got 80, some of them. So that's the way we got our allotment. I, I, I couldn't explain that to you. Coker what? Coker, what uh, crops did y'all grow, and how did y'all preserve y'all food? The crops wasn't uh, too much. It was, uh, we just had, uh, we had to have corn, but of course the Indians just can't be without corn. You can't starve an Indian if they've got corn, because they fix them up in different uh, ways, and uh, they, they get along that way. And uh, and now the for preserving things, they didn't know how to plan, and they just dried things like uh, even beef that uh, that uh, flattened the meat, and then if they had houses, they put the put the meat on top of the roof and dried them, or else they had a little rope or something to. Put the, just like you do clothes, you know, hang them out, and that's the way they did with the with the meat. And uh, they dried the apples too. They cut them in thin slices, and they dried everything then. Miss Coker, what about farm machinery? How did you use that to farm stuff with? And did you have cattle and chickens, or what kind of farm machinery or uh, livestock did you have? We, well, we, in time we got uh, cattle and horses and uh, just like the white people were, there were some white people living among us, we, they must have been renters and uh, they first our farming was on a small scale, but it gradually, it gradually grew bigger, and and then we that was about all that we. Oh yes, the implements and things we they were scarce, and we just had the turning plow and. Uh, Indian plow, and I don't remember if we had a harrow and or not. Maybe we had uh, harrows, and we had uh, uh, double shovel. We had that. And oh yes, and mules and horses. Yes, uh huh. We had them. Well, uh, we finally got some cattle, and uh, we tried to live uh, like the white people around us. <laughs> Ms. Coker, uh, how did you get your clothing? Did you make them, or did you buy them at the store? Did your mother make them for you, or how did you get your clothing? Uh, our clothing was made at home, and uh, the cloth was awfully scarce, hard to get. And most of the cloth come from uh, Muskogee or Toko, those old towns. And uh, when we do get it, we have to be awful careful with them, not to uh, wear them out. If we, uh, try to keep from wearing them out. And uh, there's I don't know, a way back now, my old aunt said that they weaved the cloth. I don't know, but when I know, they didn't then. Yes, and uh, when we went, when they went after things at uh, Muskogee, it took, uh, they, of course, they went in a wagon, and it took them weeks to go and come back. Coker and your uh, houses, um, what kind of constructions and uh, materials did y'all need and uh, 
how did y'all heat and cool off and uh, who built your homes and uh, how did y'all build y'all homes? What kind of techniques did y'all use? They built them of uh, logs and there were several men would get together because they're heavy and uh, they would build a help each other about building their homes and we didn't have of course we didn't have no electricity no anything to cool us off we just sat in the shade and we used uh, wood stoves I still have my wood stove yet and uh, I hang on to my old ways I guess and and then as uh, time went on we got to building frame houses. They got to building frame houses and uh, and they kept on now. Most of them got uh, brick houses. I lived over there by Pleasant Grove. So I never was, I never lived in the middle of the Seminole County. Did you go to what closest church did you go to and who often get it together with? How often? Did you get together with neighbors and what what did y'all do in the gathering? I uh, I never went to stomp dances and ball games, Indian ball games, because my father wouldn't let us go. He let the boy go, but he wouldn't think of letting us go. So I wanted to see what they were like. After I married, I went, but I didn't take no interest. I didn't even get out of the car. And so I don't care about stomp dances or ball games. And uh, then, uh, and what else did you do? Oh, then I went to Presbyterian Church because my folks, uh, that is, mother, belonged there. And uh, they would come, there's other Presbyterian churches, and they would come. They, on certain occasions, they would come and uh, on Fridays, or maybe, uh, yes, on Fridays, and stay till Monday morning, and uh, and they, uh, and then they would go home. Yeah, they would go home on Monday mornings, and I'm mixed up here. What? Uh, well, they they just worship uh, God like uh, any other people would in church. They sang, they prayed, and of course they got that from the missionaries that came and uh, worked among them. And the one that worked among the Presbyterian was named Mr. Ramsey. He came from from the east. I don't know just where, but he he learned to talk Indian and he had a little school down at Milwaukee and there some of the older Indians they all then pass on now they they went to school there I think that okay I thank you Miss Coker thank you for everything you've done Have an interview with Miss McCauley on Governor John Brown. Just a follow up of previous recording. Oh, that's a field call. It's James, Governor. They probably had not switched around a lot. I don't know where we got this idea of sheep. Oh, I don't know where we got it from the wild tribe. You know that. <laughs> and we talked about your social life there. You know, like you didn't get the permit to go to stop dances. Oh, uh huh. Then yeah, we got into church when you went down to Florida. Florida. Mm -hmm. Then talk a little about this uh, this graveyard on the other side of home there, who was buried first and second. Mm -hmm. right out here. Right.
it's mostly around the bottom, bottom area now. The church teaching. Because they help establish the, the mother church of this one down here, you know, the New Orchard. Then it's the top church of mother church to this one.
usually do all the trading with money, or did they trade for other stuff? Well, they, <coughs> they used money, but sometimes, uh, if we say credit, they had what they call, uh, actually, uh, if I can remember, uh, they had uh, issued paper, and they called it a due bill. Up until, they, you know, when they, I guess the Seminoles got their money annually, I don't know when. I don't know, I don't recall how they did, but they had payments, you know. And they, they extended the company, credit, company, uh, credit to them. Mm -hmm. And if you, uh, I think there's some, one of those, uh, uh, they call it ships, I guess, what they call it. Well, um, I know of a man here, if he, if he still has it, if he hadn't turned it over to somebody, uh, his father, A.M. Saran, was an employee at this store, and he he kept some of these, you know, and he, of course, he's been gone now several years, but he has a son here, and I might ask him sometimes if he has, but I'd just like to see it. Okay. I've seen them, but I can't remember. Right. I can't remember what they look like, but it was kind of like a check. Mm -hmm. But I don't recall, because at that day and time, I was just a child, and I, those things didn't, didn't, I wasn't interested, you know. <clears throat> well, of course, uh, the housing, the construction was of different variety, mostly log. I don't recall any of our Indians or any teepees in the Seminole County. We didn't have, but they did have long cabins because we come from the great right southeast, you know. Right. And they have these little log houses and maybe one or two rooms with a lean to, you know, and a porch. That's the original kind of homes that they lived in. Some of them were, had, were bigger according to the size of the family, I would think. Did the uh, man of the house build this by himself, or did they have a, some well, kind of gathering? <coughs> well, that I don't know. I imagine he would, if he had friends, I, I would think that they would come and help him because that's the way the church people did. If one needed help, they'd all go to him, and then and if he needed help, they'd come to him. And they'd all come to one another and help one another. Mm -hmm. That's in my day and time to what I would call. Right. And uh, as I was young, as I said, there's a lot of things that took place of, of significance that I didn't realize what they were, you know. But, of course, uh, as I told you, I uh, was brought up in the church, and that's the way the Christian people did, help one another. You think that as far as church goes, the, the members are fading away a little bit these days? It's well, not as strong as it used to be? Those that are in the church as strong as they ever were, but as you say, it's just like everything else. I think that the younger ones have too many other things going, and they're not as, as perhaps not as conscientious about their religion as the older people were. The older people were sincere, and they, when they, that was their life, the church life. Of course, we can just like any other, any other race of people. There are some that were, uh, as I said, uh, religious, and uh, I mean, uh, they were faithful to their religion when it come easy. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we had some that during the summertime when the dances were going on, they would go back and go to the dances, and we have that right now, this day and time. Right. And, uh, as I said, uh, they're not dedicated Christians, but they wouldn't do that. I remember when I was a child, they used to, if we were outside, they used to come after us with a switch. They don't well, do it these days. No, they don't. And uh, they had the, you know, the church, the proper ones, the deacons usually. Uh, they didn't so much as uh, they wanted you to, they were strict, they wanted you to behave on the church premises and to take in the services. And this day and time, it's, 
everybody has an automobile. The, and the children out there sitting in the cars listening to the radios and, and things like that. And uh, as I said, all this stems from the home training, you know, it comes from the home training. As you, you can see that they're not training their young ones as they should. Right. And uh, uh, personal uh, recollections. Well, when did I arrive in Oklahoma? I think I arrived here in 1899, but I was born here in Wewoka. And uh, the site, I know, but the building has been torn down. And where did you come from? Well, my grandfather, they were born over at Fort Gibson there, but uh, his father and mother came from Florida. The uh, father of my great-grandfather was a gospel, but gospel, he was a doctor, and he married a poor bloody Indian woman. And it seems as though that, that, that they told me that as a, a girl, she was not very well, and the parents said, if you can make her well, you can have her. And that's the way she became his wife and raised a large family. They, and they were all over here born at Fort Gibson. And later on, they came to what is uh, Ocean Old County now. But uh, from what I understand, that they were located down a little farther from Canal down that way, it was mostly in what would the peace would be probably on the county now, I guess. But then later, as the time went on, they uh, come to stop. And then that's where the, the oldest one, he was John S. Brown, in later times became the governor, which they call chief now. They did call him governor, and uh, there was another name. That, you, you remember what they called John Brown, the younger to John Brown? No, the whole thing I can recollect is they called him governor. And, uh, well, no, I mean the young. I do. No, 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 the young John that was here just recently, that preceded under it, Terry Follett. Oh, no, no. It was a name that they called him, but I can't, I can't recall what it was. Anyway, then uh, the chiefs were, they were elected, and the way they voted, they just, they, what they tell me, for one person, they just line up on, line up on one side, just like you would choosing up for a game, you know. Those on one side was for so and so, and those on this other side was for their candidate, or whatever you might call. You mean it? We weren't decided by a group of people, we no. were just decided by few. Well, those that would come there to vote, and only the men could vote, you know. It's just been recently that the women could vote for the chief. And we had our first election, the Seminole had their first election when they elected Terry Walker. And the women got to vote in that one, and we voted by ballot. Well, how did this, uh, David, how did she get elected? Well, she was appointed by the uh, uh, president again. They were uh, by appointment, you see, in Washington. And they had a specific duty for her to do, you know, when they elected her. But she stayed, I, I, I don't recall how long she was uh, governor, but you know, I showed you the picture when they uh, Right. When she was, not, I mean, what do you call them? Put in office. Right. And, uh, and her family, you know, so the picture, the picture. They were by appointment from Washington. Well, there's only one, uh, these Brown, were they brothers? Or was there yes. only one? No, they were brothers. It, it come like this, Governor Brown, John S. Brown, he was the governor. He was the oldest of the family. And the, the doctor, the, his father, died early in life. 
And uh, I mean, they were children, but young. Well, the governor had left it up to him to help his family, his brothers and sisters. And he had sent them to school, got them in school. And uh, then uh, my grandfather, which was down the line from him, he had, he wasn't for nothing. He was, they had some sisters between the governor and, and A.J. But they were, became partners. And he took care of this trading post here, and there was a big one in Sasaka, too. And he, he had, he took care of that one over there. Uh, it was first, now if you remember, there's a marker out there where it says the mansion of Governor Brown, like you're going to Ava. Right. Well, the first store was there. But when the railroad comes through, I'm sure that was the reason, they moved it to the present side of the stock mm -hmm. And uh, that store burned in later years, in the 20th I guess. Because uh, Governor Brown died, I think, in 1918, and my grandfather died in 1917. Then, uh, of course, his son, Lewis Brown, who later became a, uh, a preacher, was ordained a preacher to the ministry of. He was, he took over, he was the one that took care. Then he made several trips to Florida, too. In behalf, you know, the Indian people. And yeah. he brought a group up here at one time. But it was a group, I mean, it wasn't just two or three, it was a, a group of them. And uh, uh, talking about the church, my father was the, my grandfather. My father died while we were young, and my grandfather then took over and raised his grandchildren. But I was with him from the time I was. Uh, and uh, then, as I told you before, that he was interested in the people in Florida. He had made several trips down there, and he always took somebody that could show more Indian than here or that could talk in different languages that, that, that the Indians spoke down in Florida. The Mississippi language especially, he took a, a man from the north part of the county up here whose name is W.L. Joseph. And then a, a man named Clarence, not, not Clarence Russell, but John Russell. I'm thinking about Clancy. We have one over here in the church that we know a priest man. He's over there with the church. Uh, but this man was named John Wesley. And if I did I show you those pictures? I didn't show you. Did I show you yes. the pictures? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, on about the fourth of ship, I guess it was third or fourth ship, that he took this group of his church members, and there was. Uh, the Two other preachers and his and their wives, and his sister Miss Allison Davis, and she had her daughter Mrs. Uh, w. S. T. Irene Davis was her name, but she really was Mrs. W. S. T. Mm -hmm. And then uh, she had a he had a ward. Her name was Lisa Bruno. She went along, and of course uh, I I went along with my grandparents everywhere they went, and so I was included in it. Not as a, just, just to be going, I guess, just to take the family, I imagine, is the way it was. Because I was quite young. And they made this trip family and After we got there, why, the Indians would only come so far from a little town, and we had to then meet them halfway, as he said. Wasn't halfway, but actually, but I mean, we had to make that gesture, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. And we went in and wagon to this place where they would come and were willing to meet us. And as I told you, I didn't know how long we stayed down. It seemed like a long time to me. It might have been 10 days, I don't know. Out in this uh, camp, you know, out in the wilderness, I'd call it. Right. Everglades, maybe it was. I don't know what it was, but anyway, it was out there where they met the Indians. And the whole trip, I, I, I would imagine, as I said, I don't recall how long it was. I recall some of the incidents on the way down there and on the way back. But we went by a rail, train. 
I had the pictures, you know, the, of the group in several different, you know. Mm -hmm. Didn't you say this one was the second one buried out here in local Yes, Kansas? it was the second one after this, uh, the city bought the present Oakwood Cemetery out here at this location. But she was the, and she was the one that made the trip with the people down Florida, you know. She was, and uh, she was the second one that was buried there. The first one was a little boy. He was killed by a horse. And she was the one that helped him select the lot that he bought for the family, you know. Mm -hmm. And the, the gravestone, you can tell, the, the base on, is on it out there. This is her allotment right here, right on that border of Seminole Nation and the Creek Nation where they join. This yeah. is Miss Bill Gavin out here. Well, she, her uh, uh, allotment, this is her homestead here, but there it was the surplus, you know, and she gave the, uh, donated the land to the church out here. Who was this Reverend George, George Scott? Well, he was a <coughs> preacher out here, and he was the one that made the trip to Florida also with his wife. Mm -hmm. And later on, they established that church out there on the highway from Holmdale to the Mission. Mm -hmm. This church out here, you know what you mean, middle creek. Right. Peace. Who else is uh, Ivy Harbor? <coughs> oh, she said Mrs. Ivy Harbor is the daughter of John S. Brown. She's the only, not the only living one, but the, she's the oldest living of these children. And what was it I to ask you to go see her about? I forgot what it was. I don't know. I got a question mark now, but I don't know what it was. Uh, There's something I think you might say, find out something about from her. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. But she is Stephanie uh, Brown's daughter. Mm -hmm. Did you say there's one of the oldest houses in Weewoka? The it's one you said that? The, the one I'm living in? Yes, ma'am. It's one of the oldest. It's not the oldest, but it's, I just, uh, there might be one or two others that are older. That's about all I have to ask you. Uh -huh. and, uh, well, I hope that I'll help you in any way that I can. I know it's not very trying, but as I said, it's some of it. It's just what I remember. Right. Yeah. I'm sure there are a lot of other things that are more important, but just that's just like I recall it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, his wife, did you leave your parents and the rest of your family at home? No, we, they came on the, on the train before. And then, then we started on January the 1st and uh, go through in a wagon team. The wagon team. What size family did you have and where were they when you got mm -hmm. here to Oklahoma? They were out uh, at Haney, Oklahoma. That's about three miles uh, east and a mile south of uh, of uh, Little, and uh, where you? your family. What size family? Did you well, well, the family was. Uh, let's see, there was there was twelve of us then in the family, and we formed on Uncle George Combs' place, 
the first year and then later moved to Chiaho and broke out a place over there for Chastain, W.B. Chastain. Uh, this place <coughs> that you moved, uh, you said had an Indian name. Would you tell me again the name and what it meant? Halakaji is an Indian name for the place where we moved to and uh, on, on and Halakaji means big arch potato to tell me. And uh, the, this this was Chiaha, where we moved to. And my father and brother-in-law built the first school, that was the only school that was ever there. And uh, my brothers and sisters went to school there at Chiaha. And I also run a barber shop for, before I got married and made it my home after, after I got married, moved it up on the lease and went breaking out the ground. Uh, you told me earlier that uh, this uh, Chirha, say it for me, Chirha, Chirha. meant uh, hills and hollers yeah. in Indian, and that it was 11 miles northeast of Seminole. Yeah. yeah. You said you went to school at Ferguson. Would you tell me how you got to school and describe the school building and your teacher? I walked, and it's about three miles or three and a quarter, and we walked there, and uh, that just had the one teacher, and he taught all the class at one time. When you came to Oklahoma from Arkansas, you were very nearly to your 17th birthday. How many years did you go to school after you came to Oklahoma? One, one year. Went to Ferguson after we moved over. I didn't go when I was over at the Haney, and then I went to Ferguson School one year, and that was all. Did you go to school all year round? No, we took out for pick cotton, and I don't I don't know when we took out or how long the school was, but I think it's about six months a year. All right, after you finished your education, what kind of a job did you take? Uh, I, I went to I first went to Western Business College at Shawnee for one week, and I got disgusted with it and come back and went to work in the store for Brain. Where was this store? In Seminole. What kind of a store was it? It was a general store that handled everything. And uh, I worked there, uh, I started in at $25 a month. And I quit on the account of wanting to play baseball. You said um, that you could speak Indian, would you tell me what your job, how your job used uh, this ability to speak Seminole Indian? Well, uh, the, the, some of the Indians at them days that couldn't talk in, and they wouldn't, wouldn't buy nothing. They'd just stand and look at it, and you had to just run it down. And I, I got to where I could talk a little bit of Indian language, and so he wanted me to go to work for him, and I did. Uh, tell me what kind of a store it was, what they had there. Describe, just tell me some of the things that was in the store and also uh, about the Indians that came into trade. Well, it was, they had all kinds of food there and hardware, such as cultivators and stuff like that. And they had groceries and dry goods and peace goods. For, and uh, it was a great big store, and uh, they had a lot of stuff in there, and I was, I was lost about half the time I was in there. How did the Indians uh, receive the money that they used to spend in your store? Did they work for it? No. No, that the government paid them that much. The head right or something or other. I think uh, that they got paid once a week during that time. That was 1910. And uh, I quit quit this job on account of playing baseball. I thought I was, I was a baseball player and I wanted to play and play again in Boston Bloomers, and I quit. Uh, the Boston Bloomers is an unusual name. Why were they called that? Because it's all women, Boston Bloomer team, and they traveled and went all over the world. What was the name of your team? The Smith team is all I knew. A T. H. Smith, I think it was. Gugui, Gugui Smith, we called him. Was your team all boys? And how good were they? Did you beat the girls or not? We just beat them three games, all, and they didn't get a score. 
were you all fellas on the team? Yeah. All right. Uh, now we know that you're a baseball fan. Uh, what position did you play on the team, and where did the team play? Well, it's about where the Park Drugstore is now, or Diamond was. And uh, so, uh, uh, you mean uh, what, what's the, their team name? What position did you play oh, on I the team? Oh, I played shortstop on the team. Okay. Besides baseball, what other things did you do for recreation? Well, that's about all there was to do on this ride a horseback and run a horse racing and raffle and jump. <laughs> What about church? Did you go to church? Oh, yeah, went to church. We went to church and Sunday school. They didn't have much Sunday school if they did church. Them little country schools like they had out there. I know that uh, your family lived uh, several miles northeast of Seminole at the time you were working in, in this store, the Stargood store. Would you tell me... How did you go home at night, or did you live in Seminole, or what? No, I stayed on board with Mr. Ball there in Seminole, and I stayed there, and I just went home uh, on on Saturday evening, Saturday night. This was just this is not a boarding house, but just no, a family. Just a family house. Uh, he run a wagon yard and had this house there, and I knew him, and they they said I could stay there with him, and I stayed there with him. Okay, do you remember how much you paid them for the privilege of staying, and, and what kind of room did you have? Well, I think it was two, two and a half a week. How much did you make a week? $25 a month. $25 a month, and and did you get any raises? I got two and a half dollar raise each month, as long as that's till I'd get to 75. That is the limit. 75, was that good pay oh, in those yeah. days? Oh, yeah, awful good. Because all we paid is a dollar a day for for nine, ten hours in the, working in the field, and I thought that was pretty good. How old were you at the time that you worked in this store? I was 20. How did you meet your wife? I know you have been married. Yes, I met her there at the store. Her and Lottie Ball come up there to read the newspaper, but I took it right the other way that she come up there to see me, and that's where I met her at. At the store. How did girls, single girls, dress at that time? Well, they wore a white waist and a skirt and a great big wide-rimmed hat. Well, they all dolled up, I guess. What about the fellas? How did they dress? Well, they dressed in just an ordinary clothes and had bell-bottom pants. I know that. And I had a pair of them. And pointed shoes, I believe you said. Oh, yeah. Then I wore five and a half then, and boy, I... Okay. Would you tell me where your boarding house, or the home that you lived in while you were working, where it was located in Seminole? Well, that's right across from uh, from the bus station north. Just across the street north there, where the, that St. Clair station was. That's where his house was. Did uh, they have dances in the community in those days? Yeah. Yeah, they had dances, and, and I attended to pretty near all of them, I guess. I wouldn't miss one. Well, uh, when I came into your home, I couldn't help but notice that you had some beautiful violins here that you were working on. Do you play the violin, and did you play for dances? Yeah, I played the guitar then, them days. I didn't play the violin very much, and we have them here, and... It, and we have 27 of them. Yeah, and, uh, and well, there's it's, it's more than that. He's got some old house over there. And we have 27 of them for sale. And we repair violins, do any kind of work on them. When you played for dances, uh, how many, what other instruments were in your group, and where did you hold the dances? Two. It's two instruments. What, get, what get, two? Guitar and the violin is all the work to it. Sometimes a banjo in the place of the guitar. We had them in the home, just in the home. Was it square dancing? Yeah, all of it. All right. Most all of it. Had you called for square dancing? Yeah. So probably then after you met the girl that would become later your wife, you took her to dances. Yeah. Uh, 
one and had a big fight and she went screaming and said that was the last she go to and that's the last I ever asked to go to. I didn't go to very many more after that. Okay. Um, how did um, you get to her house while you were dating? Walk. Walk or trotted or run. <laughs> and uh, later I got a, a buggy and then I could have go. I was up among the big boys then. How far did you have to walk before you got your buggy? Well, it's, it's around three or three and a quarter miles. No road, just right through the woods. Did you have a hard time convincing her daddy that he ought to let you have her for your wife? No, it was her mother's the one. Her mother wasn't going to let me get the license. I already had them. She didn't know it. I got them illegally. And she said she'd she'd put off said she's not old enough of mine. I said, Oh yes she is. I said, and you're not getting married until she gets eighteen and I threw the paper down the license down on the bed there and she said, and boy, she just go down. Then you did marry as soon as the girl was old enough to marry and how no, old we married you? then. I had the license already. Was she eighteen? No. But the license said she was. Yeah. I swore it, it was, but it wasn't. And they took your word for it? Yeah. Okay, tell me something about your um, wedding day. Uh, what did you wear to your wedding? I wore, wore a, a suit, a black suit, white shirt, celluloid collars. And I don't know what kind of a hat I had. Of course, everybody wore a hat then, you know. There wasn't nobody who went bareheaded. Where did you buy your suit? At Hammonds and we woke up. From an old man, Hammond. And what about your wife? Did she wear the traditional white wedding gown? Yeah. She bought it at Killingsworth. Jim Killingsworth at Seminole. Were you married in your home or in a church? And married in their home, in my wife's father's home. The George Mitchell, Methodist minister. And there was two of us married at the same time, four of us. And uh, they still live. They celebrated the 61st anniversary, uh, October the 12th. The other couple that was married at the same time you were? Mm-hmm. They live at the cell, and they was uh, 61 years, 12th. What was your wife's name before she was married to you? Freddie Mae Bratton. How many children did you have? Uh, four or five altogether. We lost one, two boys and two girls. Well, that sounds like quite a family, and, and we've come to where you've got married. Let's go on now and find out where did you live after you had married Freddie. Uh, we lived at Shawha in a little barber shop that I'd, I'd had before that, and I moved it up there on the lease and settled down there and, and broke the lease out. Stayed there in 1912. Then in 1913, I moved up to. Well, I went to work for Lice Brown. I uh, had a big cattle man. I worked out about three months. When my second boy was born, I, I was working there. Then we went up to. Oh, what, uh, not Ferguson, but. Sylvan. And I. Uh, Rented a farm there in 1913 and farmed, and, and that's where I quit the farm. Tell me about where Sylvan is. It's just a store in the post office and, uh, and the doctor's office there, and that's all there was to it. Could you tell me about where it was located in this area? Uh, yes, yeah, I think it was uh, five miles. Uh, Five miles south and three miles east of Kilcock Falls, I believe it was. I couldn't tell you just the, the road section didn't run straight then. The road didn't. But that's where I think it was. And put the old timers all know where old Sylvan used to be. It's not where the new Sylvan is now. You said that you moved in on your lease. I think of a lease as somewhere where there's an oil well. But no. you farmed this lease. Would you tell me how you went about getting well, the lease? Well, uh, this old fellow that moved from Arkansas with us up there, 
by the name of Roberts, he had bought this place and I leased it off of him for one year and paid him the third and fourth. That's a third of of uh, the corn and the fourth of the cotton. And uh, I raised an awful good crop there and it wouldn't pay for the picking, so I got mad and sold out and went to the oil fields, Grumont, in 1913. I got up there and, and uh, Halloween, 19 and 14, no, it was 13 yet, wasn't it? And went to work in the oil field. And I, to I told my wife and went in there and seen them torches. If I was going to drill one of them wells in five years, and she said, oh, you can't do it. And I did. Tell me what uh, an oil lease looked like when they began to move in the equipment. It's just, just, just woods and farmland, or not no farmland, just woods, you might say. They just clean off a place there with teams and and uh, put up a rig and start drilling and tanks. What did the tanks look like? Wooden tanks. All of them wooden tanks would have wasn't no steel tanks then. It was all wood. What about the rigs that drilled? They was all wood, made out of wood. Everything was made. They had to make them themselves. Such as bull wheels and band wheels and all that stuff, they had to make it all. And the, the rigs were 72 feet tall. How many men worked on the rig did they build it on did the, they build the rig on the location yeah, they it and there. left it there yeah just left it yeah just they don't hold them in no more like they do now they just built whole lumber out there and built the rig and left it right there there's some them still standing okay how many men worked on a, a rig you mean the drilling or yes the drilling. two yeah. two at a time 12 hour tower okay tell me what their job was well, one of them was drilling, the other one two dresser. The two dresser had all the work to do, you might say. And the driller, he stayed in there, and all he'd done was run that drill and run the machinery part of it. And he'd done all the ignorant end of it. I was called a warthog. <laughs> now tell me why you were called that. Well, because we were nasty all the time. Had to get had uh, our hands all dirty and our feet dirty and our clothes would get dirty, you see. No matter if you change every day, it get, get dirty and they call us warthogs. I've heard my husband say, uh, talk about weevils. Have you heard that? Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's on the uh, uh, rotary tools. There's a weevil when you come out and you don't know anything about it, they call you a weevil. You have to learn it, you see. Uh, well, on this Derrick rig that has been built on the location out of wood. Drilling is what they're doing, is that not right? They're drilling for oil? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they drill for oil. And uh, there's, there's several different sands, you know, that you go through, and they have to stop and test them out as you go through them. Whose job was it to test? Uh, the drillers, or did they bring in yeah, some well, we, specials? We brought the samples up, and then they had a sample chaser went around and chased out these samples. And I guess that was about all it was. About, uh, when you say chased out, does that mean he tested the samples? Mm -hmm. He tested them out and, and made them to and from, you know, like from 2,700 feet to 2,710 feet he made out that. How did you draw a sample? Well, we got it in the baler and dumped it out in the bucket and washed it out. What do you mean by baler? Well, what's the bale out them holes with? You know, big long baler that you stick down the hole and run down there on the sand line and pick up the stuff from the bottom, bring it up and dump it into the dump box. It was kind of like a long, tall, skinny bucket? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Only there's about 30. 30 feet long. Okay, can you tell me if there were accidents on on these rigs? Uh, uh, can you remember any time that an accident happened and what caused it, a fire or someone hurt? Oh, yes, I've seen fire. We, 
I was in one one place where the whole rig got on for underneath the boards, you know, there's twelve inch boards like that. And the gas was coming up from onto the floor and we had a, a forge lit and it got as far in there and it burnt them holes out about that wide through them floorboards all through there. What do you mean by forge? That's the word I'm not familiar with. Well, that's where you dress the bed to hit them, you know. The great big old device built like a, just like a chimney. You put the bed in there and then shoot that gas to it and heat it and then jerk her out and put her on this anvil and ram it out. It will bet to be about that big. That's about almost a yard wide, no, two feet? No, it's 20, 24 inch bits. That's the biggest ones I worked on. Could you describe one of the bits to me? Well, it's about uh, about six feet long, and uh, it weighs about uh, 3,000 pounds. How did you pick it up? The crane, chain horse. Did you have help, or did just the two of you do it? Just the two of us. How much money did you make? I started in at five dollars uh, for twelve hours, two dozen. Did you get paid uh, as soon as the day was over, or at no, the end of the job? No, you got got paid when the well was finished. What if it didn't come in? If it were dry hole? Well, that was, that didn't make any difference. They had the contract the contract to get his money, and then he'd pay you. But well, he never got paid on the, on them holes till they finished the well up. If it took six months, that was it. How? How long does the well ordinarily take in the drum right in Seminole area in well, those uh, days? Uh, now, nowadays, it was, you, you can drill one in about, well, anywhere from 9 to, to 25 days. And then it took from, well, I'll say from 25 to 60 days up there, drum right. Did you work for the same company all the time? Mm -hmm. No. No, I worked for the Pure Oil Company. It was... Uh, I see, I worked for them when, in 1918, I was working for them, and they were the one that put me to drilling. And so I worked for several contractors, like the Duval Bar up at Perry, and, oh, I've worked with many of them. I can't think of all of them. I worked for the Texas company. All right. When a, when a well was drilled down to oil or to gas. Tell me what happened at the location. Well, you just, uh, you had to put your connection on and get ready to let it go into the tank. Connect the well up. Well, what if you didn't get that connection on soon enough? Then what happened? Oil just went everywhere, and you was right in it. I've had oil bath all day long for 12 hours. Uh, did they take precautions to keep uh, a fire from catching them? Not very much. They moved the boiler back when they go drill in the way, got the one where the main fire was, you know, and they moved the forge out. That's the only precautions they ever took. Oh, we did have a snuff line, what, two-inch snuff line for steam. You pull right down the snuff out the fire. Uh, where did the steam come from? The boiler. You know, the boiler sets off. Oh, for the nip the store from the rig. Usually that for. And in case of a, the, the hole get a far away, you just jerk that thing down. It's made the hand shape. Just jerk it down. It had a piece of pipe flattened out like that. And it just blowed it out, snuffed her out. Okay, you went in with the oil blowing out and used this steam to, to stop the well from blowing. No, couldn't, uh, no, it. We couldn't stop the well from blowing. It just shut, shut the fire off. We turned it on there, and it won't catch fire when you got the long. You got that steam in it. How did you get the well shut down enough to put it into a tank? Well, we'd have a control head on it, and then shut it just like a big stop. Shut it in, and then they go ahead and, and connect up the 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 tanks and the well up to the tanks, and then open up the control head and go right into the tank. At the time that you went to Drumright, did they have um, conservation restrictions or were wells drilled just anywhere? No, they drilled, uh, the, they could drill them the, the, then just ever, 
every location. Doesn't matter how many, if, if there's 160 acres, you can drill 16 wells on it. What did they do with the salt water? Turned it out right on the ground. I'd like to have you tell me now, once the oil came out of the hole and went into the tanks, then what did they do with the oil? Pipeline's taking it over, and there's uh, up to the pipeline man, and they mailed out all the money for this, for the, this oil. That, and uh, that's as far as I know about that. Well, uh, when you first went into the old patch in 1913, did they have pipelines at that time? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they had pipelines the same as do now. It's all thread uh, pipes, you know, had screwed together and no clamps or no nothing like that. Say the location was muddy. How did the people get in and out to the well in those days? Walked. <laughs> you walked in if you couldn't get in there, why? He walked in, I was mud that deep to get into it. Up there in Illinois. I worked up in Illinois too, some, you know. And then I went to work uh, 27 for uh, Schaefer Oil Company over here at, at, at Bull Eggs. And I worked over there until Tex come, come along and they wanted me to go to work for them, so I went to work for them. Could you tell me how you think the oil industry affected uh, Seminole County and what other counties that you lived in? Oh, it, it wouldn't have been much Seminole County here if it hadn't been for oil. The oil is, it means everything, and it still does. There's, that's what makes Seminole, and we woke in all these little towns around here. Do you remember how Seminole looked during the boom days? Could you describe it to me? Oh, goodness, yeah. It just mud from one end of one street to the other, and cars jammed and stuck. Now, I, I just didn't go, didn't go over there very much. I didn't want to get in on that traffic. I see them lined up for a half a mile down the road there on that 99 South Seminole, trying to get by, and they couldn't. But I've seen worse than that at Drum Rot. I've seen as high as 50. 50 Wagons of, of uh, pipe were going down, down the road one time. You couldn't get around them. And uh, all you'd have to do is just get up and beat them to it. It started before they did. It hauled two or three strings of pipe in at one time. And, and then big old teams and boys and mud all over the world. Uh, you said uh, wagon loads of Like what kind of roads were uh, were there at that time? None. Just mud and didn't have no pavement of no kind. Just mud and. Cold. 